Welcome to Rain's first webcast of 2012, and in it we'll be looking at some of our predictions, hopes and dreams for the year ahead. I've got a feeling that 2012 will be a bumper year for music technology. We're all bored of this economic crisis, and it's time to get creative and innovate. And with the NAMM show just a couple of days away, I can't wait to see what's coming up. Putting aside all thoughts of May and promises of catastrophe and apocalypse, here's what we'd like to see in 2012. With Reason 6 bringing in the long-awaited 64-bit rewire at the end of 2011, a fully 64-bit software studio is nearly within reach. There are two notably stubborn bits of recording software languishing in the world of 32-bit, Ableton Live and Pro Tools. Live has successfully transitioned from a cool and quirky loop and synth based performance tool into a fully fledged piece of production software, and now it's due an update. Hopefully, version 9 will bring it up to speed. Pro Tools has traditionally been slow to take on new technology. It likes to get things right and then stay there for as long as possible before doing anything that might upset it. Version 10 brought in 64-bit compatibility, but the core still remains 32-bit. It's probably to maintain compatibility with older hardware, although why not have two versions like everyone else? 2012 will hopefully see them cross that divide. On the plug-in side, the UAD cards from Universal Audio still run only 32-bit plugins, which strain the BitBridge technology often beyond its capability. Waves are another culprit, powerful plugins that are restricting the rest of the otherwise 64-bit system. RAM is cheap, 16 gigs is a no-brainer upgrade these days. It would be nice if we could use it all. Something else I'd like to see for Ableton Live is the inclusion of support for video loops. French company Resolume have been coming at this from the VJ direction, and their powerful video performance software is including more and more audio facilities. If Live could trigger and sync video loops like it does with audio, then they would really have the VJ market all sewn up. 3D technology seems to be very polarizing. You either love it or you hate it. Although it's been largely successful in cinema, slow sales of 3D televisions indicate that the public are less keen on the hassle of dealing with the glasses at home. In the computer gaming fraternity, games such as Batman Arkham City and Skyrim have demonstrated that there's beauty to be found in stereoscopic gaming, and apparently Nvidia have now sold over half a million pairs of 3D vision glasses. What possible relevance could this have for the computer musician? Well, as the technology is becoming more affordable and more popular, perhaps it's worth exploring what could be possible in the 3D mixing environment. I mean, currently when we see waveforms, we see amplitude against time. Would it not be interesting to also see frequency on another axis? The advocates of old school mixing suggest turning off the screens and using just your ears, but a whole generation of computer musicians have learned to mix visually as well as orally. Why not push this to the next level? What would it mean to visualize your mix in three dimensions? Perhaps this is just a flight of fancy, but the technology is there, so why don't we play with it? And also, glasses free 3D tellies are out this year. Could that translate to the desktop? Microsoft have been heavily hinting at a 2012 release for their completely reworked version of Windows. In our testing of the developer version, it, it looks very good indeed, and the performance is going to be even better than Windows 7. The issue that everyone is talking about is the Metro interface, the touch-friendly, big-button, side-swiping front-end. Brilliant for tablets, not so brilliant if you're mousing around on a desktop computer. All the moaning seems a bit self-defeating and detracts from the creative and inventive ways that could move us forward. A simple touchpad device next to your mouse, integrated into your keyboard, would do the job without having to strain yourself using a vertical touchscreen. Microsoft are already on the ball with their touch mouse, where you have gesture control over Windows 7. It doesn't take a genius to see how this could work well with Metro. Eye tracking technology is another possibility. There's a company called Toby that's developing software that tracks your eye movement so it can see exactly where you are looking on the page and use that information to sideswipe the Metro interface. With this in mind, maybe it's time for door software manufacturers to consider multi-touch as an option. We're already using iPad apps. Why don't they let us get our hands on a more horizontally, sort of desktop angle touchscreen to control faders, edit notes, zoom around, start controlling our software with our fingers without the expensive peripherals? Of course, there will be more and more and more cool iPad apps for controlling your software and being instruments all by themselves. But we're still stuck with running one thing at a time, and that can end up getting expensive if you want to expand. 
The recently released iRig DJ from IK Multimedia is a good example. It's a DJ controller for the iPad with crossfaders, knobs and stuff. It's fabulous. But ideally you want two iPads so you can mix between the two sources. So suddenly you end up needing about a grand's worth of iPad just to use it, just to create a little DJ mix. IK do stress that you don't need to, but it does highlight how the iPad can become a very expensive one application bit of gear. With the Windows 8 tablets on the way, maybe the iPad 3 can make all the difference. Firewire certainly seem to be on the way out. All the interfaces released in the last six months appear to be USB based. It's time for a new standard in interface connection. USB is great, but often ports are thin on the ground and almost everything else is running through them from your mouse, your printer, through to your dongles and your controllers. Thunderbolt seem to be a likely candidate, but as it's currently only on Apple products, it does rather restrict the market. There's been a lot of talk about using the Humble Network Socket, and that sounds a pretty groovy idea to me. It's a standard that's been around a long time and doesn't seem to be going anywhere. The potential of using hubs and switches and connecting up not just interfaces, but whole systems and other networks together seems immense. Particularly if you consider Windows 8. Yeah, I know I keep going on about it, but there's, that's because the potential is just so brilliant. You can have your interface on your network and access it via your main Windows 8 desktop studio machine. And then you get a great idea later and you can pick up your tablet, same apps, same access to the same files, and now use the same audio interface over the network. Fabulous. So yeah, lots of cool stuff this year, I reckon. Not to mention two new Element audio video computers that should be arriving any day now. And finally, in three weeks, my wife will be giving birth to our third child and all our hopes and dreams are for an easy and uncomplicated delivery. That's all for now.